Well, I mean, I think the bottom line is we've got interest rate cut fever in the air. That's all you can hear about. And we're recording this the day before the uh, supposed interest rate cut. So, you know, when you're listening to this, you probably already know the answer to this. But it seems like there's nothing else that Wall Street can obsess about more than what the Fed is going to do with interest rates. Is it really that important? That's my question. Rumor has it, Dad, that Ryan is going to base his entire strategy in the coming year on whether the Fed cuts rates tomorrow or today. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good plan, Chris, because I'll tell you what, when rates go down, it is bullish. Don't, don't confuse anything with anything the Fed says. I don't care. It's 25 basis points, 50 basis points. When you cut interest rates, it's good for the economy. It's good for the consumer. It's good for the stock market. It's good for the bond market. This is great news. So I guess we shouldn't fight the Fed. <laughs> Never fight the Fed, Chris. It's uh, you know, well, of course, you know, we were supposed to have six or seven cuts by this time uh, this year. It's just the economists got that really wrong, and the stock market, as we speak, is at an all-time record high, and bond yields are dropping like a rock. Okay, so Bob, what, I, what you're saying is rate cuts do matter. Is that what I'm hearing here? Is that uh, what I take away from that uh, that rant? Absolutely. But I'll tell you what, guys. I mean, it doesn't make it any easier, right? Let's take how difficult it is to invest. I mean, people think it's always simple in hindsight, right? Markets at a new high. So all I had to do is buy any time in my lifetime to make money. Um, but two weeks ago, we had the worst week of the year, two weeks ago. And last week we had the best week of the year, right? The trend is my friend, Chris. How many times you've heard that garbage in your career? Yeah, so many times. The trend is my friend till it's not. And, you know, it's so true, Dad. Like two weeks ago, I was having these end of the world conversations with clients, you know. <laughs> they got on political rants on, you know, what... What if the Fed doesn't lower interest rates? You know, what if so and so gets an office? You know, should we sell now? Completely different conversation this week. Well, I was watching uh, one of the pundits this morning, and they're saying, "Well, I'm not saying all, but some of my friends are taking capital gains to get in front of when the new president raises capital gains tax." They're like, "Well, well, that's brilliant, right? You'll have less money to invest, and then when you make capital gains on that less money, then what are you going to do?" I mean, this is yeah. so insane you know, trying to plan something that's not announced. Yeah. And again, I mean, right. It's, and who knows what are going to get passed, right? <laughs> um, and most of these things have to get through probably most likely divided Congress. Um, so, you know, it seems like whatever political party you're affiliated with, um, the other side never gets away with everything they want to get away with, uh, even though it feels like it, you know, during these time frames. But I think, you know, bottom line is to your point, Bob, you know, lower interest rates really do help a lot of parts of the economy, whether it's you know people being able to refinance their mortgage, all of a sudden they have more money in their pocket that they're free to spend. You look at like home builders are a great example of this. I didn't realize this, but two thirds of home builders are small home builders, not the big guys like Toll Brothers um, and the big names that you see. And they rely on short-term credit, right? And right now their short-term credit is at very high interest rates. So they need that to ease so they can build more homes. So there's you know more houses for the housing shortage that we have. So you know, there's, there's so many ways that lowering interest rates affects the economy in a positive way. And yet the naysayers are still out there. It's kind of mind blowing, but, uh, but overall to your point, right, this is, this is good. Not bad. You know, dad, I hear that when, when interest rates go down, that uh, certain business owners should give their employees a pay raise. <laughs> that's, that's the rumor. I think that's uh, I, I agree with that, Chris, but uh, I think your brother made a good point. I don't know where we we are, where we're uh, maybe doing the market commentary or radio show last week. And, he said, look, these negative pundits, they're basically lazy. They're lollygaggers, he called them, I think, Rick, Chris. Lollygaggers. He said, you know, they, <laughs> they make these lazy announcements. I mean, since the Fed started raising rates, the gross domestic product is up 5.5%. It's like the economy's not slowing, it's growing. But, you know, it was just lazy analysis. Rates go up, the economy goes down. Yeah, well, guess what? You know, we're, yeah. we're booming. I actually disagree with that. I think some of the pundits actually work very hard and do a lot of, like, loops to try and make it seem like we're going into a recession. <laughs> but they do. It seems like a really yeah. challenging case to build based on the uh, economic conditions. I mean, the bottom line is you know, the economy is growing even with rates higher. So the question is if rates start to come down, is that just going to add fuel to the fire? And arguably, yes, it is going to add fuel to the fire, right? Because even with the economy growing, um, we've had certain sectors of the economy that have been lagging because of those higher interest rates. So, you know, that should be a big boom for, we just mentioned real estate, um, you think of other things like banking stocks that really benefit from taking your money, lending it higher rates and trying to pay you the lowest rate possible. Well, you know, Bob, I think you and I were talking about this, but man, oh man, now that we have this preemptive interest rate cut, 
those CD rates just dropped like a rock. The banks didn't well, waste any time paying you less on your money. No, it's amazing. It's uh, and then they pull so many trades, uh, tricks rather, you know, on these on these CD offerings, right? They'll they'll get you a sucker rate, and what renews, they put you into something with three tenths of one percent because you didn't subscribe to the new sucker rate. Um, it's really kind of crazy, but you know, it's just going to be great for the stock market because you know, small cap stocks. Um, like you said, real estate, interest sensitive, dividend paying stocks, even international stocks, the dollar is weakening, you know, on interest rates coming down from the Fed, which is good, you know, for non US stocks. And, you know, up till now, it really has been narrow in terms of the earnings estimates with, um, you know, technology and the leadership. So we got a long way to go, guys. And I'll tell you, this is something that we talk about all the time. All the surprises in bull markets come on the upside. Yeah, even as much as like, I feel like two weeks ago, there were a lot of happy bears out there, just so happy that the market sold off and finally we're gonna get that big sell off. And of course the market turns right around. Going back to your thesis there, Bob, that you know, bull markets, hey, they don't let you in and typically the surprise are positive. And also just like the market's forward looking, right? We're talking about real estate, how real estate benefits from rates going down. Well, over the last three months, real estate investment trusts which trade on exchanges are up 18%. So the market was already pricing in this interest rate cut three months ago. Guess what didn't do anything over the last three months? Yeah. You stop beating up technology stocks. <laughs> the, the point is capital is rotating to other parts of the market. And this is something we've kind of been preaching for a very, very long time. The evidence is there. Other sectors now are, are really starting to move. Speaking of things accelerating, uh, I have a client of mine that owns a couple commercial properties. It's in the process of developing another one. And you know, with rates potentially coming down here, he's actually had to accelerate one of the projects that he's working on. He's like, you know, this is really a pain in the neck. He's like, but I want to make sure that we take advantage of the lower rates. Yeah, and I think that's the point, right? So there's there's been a lot of pent up demand right now. There's a lot of cash on the sidelines that's been waiting for rates to come down so deals can be done or houses can be bought, right? We've seen a big standoff in the housing market right now because people that have been locked into two, 3% mortgages, well, they don't want to move. Because uh, now they're going to get a 7% mortgage, but now that's a 6% mortgage. So it's becoming more attractive uh, for people to start to make moves with their capital. And I think that's another just a big boon uh, for the economy that's coming that's not being factored in right now. So I guess, you know, the message, the very strong pain message is the future is very bright right now. Uh, what we see reading the tea leaves, not only is growth not slowing down, it might actually be accelerating. Yeah, I think you're right, Rod, because you know the the big big uh, discussion has been about labor, right? The shortage of labor, and you know I think what a lot of these pundits miss, especially the negative nabobs that we talk about all the time, is that productivity is going up because it's amazing how much companies are spending on capex spending to improve technology and, and enhance their technology or their pro productivity, you know, through technology. So you're having you know the market forward looking is seeing this, right? And and that's why I think the market is way ahead of what or the pundits are thinking in terms of productivity, profit margins, earnings. Estimated earnings, guys, are at an all-time record high right now. Yeah, exactly. And that goes into next year. And to your point, Bob, companies are going to continue to improve their margins because of automation, artificial intelligence, robotics, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's going to be a huge boom. So I think to wrap this up is don't put your head in the sand. Don't sit in cash. Get invested now for all the opportunities right in front of us. Don't miss the boat. Hey, hope you're enjoying the most recent episode of Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars, Bob, Chris, and I will put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been up and down with the markets, extremely volatile, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, 
mutual fund brokerage product. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And guys, you know, one question we love to ask, and it's a topic that comes up with every client we have, is are you gonna outlive your money or is your money gonna outlive you? And let's face it, with longevity now, um, you know, if you're a couple that's healthy, uh, age 65, one of you is probably going to live to age 95 based on statistics. Now we're living a lot longer and you've got to plan for a lot more money than you used to. Hey guys, I just had a client tell me the other day that um, his plan is, I don't care about my money. He said, I just don't want to outlive my wine cellar. He said, I'm the Thomas Jefferson of my <laughs> times. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to leave my kids with tons of debt um, and uh, I'm going to drink all the good burgundy before I go. <laughs> hey, you should ask him if he needs help with that. I'd be happy to uh, stop by. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it sounds like a great plan, um, especially if your kids are, are going to take care of you. <laughs> How lucky do you feel, Bob? Wasn't me. It was a client that said that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> the issue is it's great to live longer, um, but as we know, the problem is you're going to probably have a lot more in terms of expenses, right? Because healthcare costs, they come with age. And you know, statistically now it's like something like $165,000 on top of your regular expenses you're going to spend on healthcare costs. And I imagine most of us don't have that factored into our financial plan. Well, I think the big issue is, you know, since I've been doing this for quite a while, you have a lot of folks that think past this prologue, right? So my, my mom and dad died in their 60s, so I'm going to die in my 60s. Or, you know, my mother lived longer, so I'm going to live longer. Um, you know, so they don't, uh, I don't need to plan because, you know, I'm not going to make it to 65, right? How many times, Chris, have you done a 401k meeting with, some of our truck drivers and some of these folks is like, Chris, I'm not even going to make it to 50. What, what do I want to save money for? So it, it's really, you, you got to, you know, if you care about your family, if you love your family, you got to do the planning. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of times I hear from clients like, oh, you know, once I retire, I'm not going to spend this amount of money or I'm not going to do this, that, and the other thing. Well, that's, that's baloney. The reality is, is that in the first couple of years, not only are you going to spend what you have spent, but you're going to continue to spend a little bit more because you're going to travel more. You know, you're not working. You're going to find ways to fill that time, and that costs money. Well, I'll tell you the other thing that happens as you get older. Your, your homes deteriorate, right? The upkeep goes up. Cost of insurance with all these storms and hurricanes we're having all over the country, natural disasters, uh, health care costs go up. So it's, um, you know, it, it really kind of compounds, right? Compounding works both ways. It's all like a, a double-edged sword, right? Don't let your money... Uh, you know, allow your money to compound and don't don't necessarily interrupt it, but you also have to be aware your your costs compound. That's why those projections you need a sophisticated tool to really understand those last years of your life can wipe you out. Yeah, they really can. And I think this assumption that you know you're going to spend less later is a complete fallacy, right? Because you think, okay, we're going to front load the trips. I always get this, Ryan. We're going to go on vacation. We're going to like spoil the grandkids early on, but then our expenses are going to go down later. Not so fast. And we have plenty of clients in our 80s that are extremely vibrant. They're still traveling, going on cruises, um, doing a lot of fun stuff that probably their parents didn't do. Um, and that costs a lot of money. So I don't think you ever want to assume your expenses go down in retirement over time. I think that's like a big mistake. You know, you should get, you've got to plan for more. And on top of that, you've got to plan for cost of living going up. So, you know, it's just there's a lot of hidden expenses that don't get factored into your financial plan. Well, the other thing too is taxes. I mean, by a show of hands, do you guys think taxes are going down in the future? <laughs> <laughs> the deficit's going to fix itself, Chris. Yeah. Taking, taking money out of your retirement account, there's going to be a tax associated with that. So you got to think about all that stuff. I don't think a lot of folks like to do planning for that reason. I mean, Chris, I've seen you in action. You stress these people out. Like this is all the stuff <laughs> that can go wrong. You know, it's like they want some happy meeting, like, Oh, everything's fine. Go spend like crazy, uh, enjoy yourself. Uh, I think that's the problem. Like people avoid this pain and troubling thought that they might run out of money. And it's, it's so key to do that annual review. It's 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 more important than your annual physical, or just as important. First of all, Dad, I, I resent that. My clients love me. Uh, they love coming to see me, and they love what I have to tell them. But you know what? You're right. It's a little bit stressful to have to dig all this information up. 
you know, especially when it comes to expenses. I mean, most people have not a clue of what they spend and it's probably 20 to 30% higher than what they think. So, you know, I think once you get a good handle on those expenses, um, you know, that's really the key to all this. Well, I think it's just knowing versus not knowing, right? And I, I think the mistake is you have to throw the kitchen sink at your financial plan. Um, you know, I always say like, you got to run it on the worst case scenario. And if you can run on the worst case scenario and you're set, then, you know, what you set yourself up for is what we call the surprises in the positive, right? You don't want surprises in the negative when it comes to your financial plan. That's why you have to build in all these extra expenses that we don't typically think about, whether it's long-term care costs, right? It's like $120,000 now a year for private nursing care. And that's a huge number. And again, for most of these plans that we see, this is not being accounted for. And you have to ask yourself, can I see a couple hundred thousand dollars on top of my regular expenses come out of my portfolio over my lifetime? Does that derail my lifestyle? And I think most of us can't answer that. Well, I think the greatest compliment we get paid as a firm is, you know, your firm cares more about my money than I do. Um, well, of course, where are they going to go live if they run out of money? They're going to become knocking on our door. So we're motivated. <laughs> the truth of the matter is it, it's, it's, it really has become more complex than it was for your parents' generation. And you know, because we're living longer and because of those healthcare costs, and we had the rude awakening of inflation, right? I mean, inflation rule of thumb is going to double over the next 20 years. And realistically, you're probably going to be retired for 20 years. So that means your costs are going to double just to do the same thing in retirement. That's a really scary thought. So that means if you need $15,000 a month now, you're going to need $30,000 a month in 20 years. So again, the question is, have you accounted for that? Well, you know what, guys? I think the bottom line here is live like tomorrow, but plan like you're going to live to 100. All right, it's a hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, first time buyers are in a crunch. Starter home prices would need to fall 32% to a median 244,000 and mortgage rates would need to drop to 3.15% or incomes would need to rise by nearly 50% to make housing affordable for typical first time buyers, according to estimates by the NAR. Man, oh man, unaffordability is really high. It really is. And it's really all about shortage, right? There's supposedly 7 million units short. They're only building like 850,000 units a year to catch up to that. People who have, uh, you know, refinanced their mortgages don't want to sell. You know, even though there, there are some of my friends who are baby boomers and want to downsize, it's like crazy to downsize when you look at the expense of buying a smaller house. It's really a conundrum. I mean, we had the... Um, COVID crisis pulls prices forward, I think at least 10 years. I, I don't know. I don't know how this gets resolved, but I'll tell you what, if I had demand to build 7 million homes, I think I'd get busy. <laughs> Should we become paying capital uh, home builders? Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're suggesting here? New line of business? I've seen think... you with a hammer, Rye, and, and I'm not so <laughs> sure that uh, we can afford the liability insurance. We'll and get one the... home done by the year 2040. <laughs> and I, I think the world's coming in when Ryan wants to own real estate. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's over, Chris. <laughs> All right, Chris. Earlier this year, Amazon bought a 960 megawatt data center campus from Talon Energy, which emerged from bankruptcy last year. The campus is powered directly by Talon's nearby Susquehanna Steam Electric Station, which generates 2.5 gigawatts of power. Ongoing power sales to Amazon will give Talon a steady cash flow. Man, oh man, all these data centers with AI are gonna need a lot of power, Chris. Well, it just goes to show you for everybody that thinks AI is expensive, uh, energy just very well may be the the back door into that trade because data centers consume a mass amount of power. That demand is just going to keep going up. Well, really, I mean, it's like every industry is going to benefit from AI or artificial intelligence, right? You don't just have to own the mega cap seven, but man, oh man, they're buying all the nuclear power <laughs> from one company. That's a lot of energy. That's a lot of energy. And I'll tell you what, none of these companies are going to benefit, you know, as they put in robotics or they put in AI, if you can't turn the lights on. So these uh, utility companies got a lot of work to do. Bob's bullish on utilities. That's what it sounds like to me. Infrastructure, baby. Biggest bull market in history, infrastructure. <laughs> Maybe we should open up our own power plant, call it Pain Power. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I hope you enjoyed episode 175, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our content, you love our content, please give us that five-star rating on iTunes. Or if it's on Spotify, you can give a five-star rating as well. You can subscribe to our channel. If it's on YouTube right now, you can like this episode, subscribe, click that notification bell. To be updated every week 
of our new content. Your support gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed.